Hello hockey fans and welcome back to another video. Several months ago, I uploaded a video detailing Jack Johnson's bankruptcy back in 2014 thanks to his parents' mismanagement of his finances. Well, just a few weeks ago, it was revealed that a wealthier, higher profile player in the league has also been forced to take the same route, as on January 11th, 2021, it was revealed that San Jose Sharks forward Evander Kane had filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Given that he has just entered the third season of a seven-year, $49 million contract, and considering he has earned over $54 million during his 11-year NHL career to date, that really does beg the question, how on earth has Kane racked up so much debt? Well, according to the reports, the forward circumstances are a lot less sympathetic than Johnson's before him. This is the story of Evander Kane, from Millionaire to bankruptcy. Before we begin, this video is brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped is the number one provider of men's below the belt grooming, trusted by over 2 million customers worldwide thanks to their precision engineered tools that help you take care of what's down there. Let's be honest here lads, looking after your crown jewels is a pretty risky affair. But with Manscaped's new and improved Lawn Mower 3.0, you can rest easy knowing that your balls are in the best of hands. With a cutting edge ceramic blade, 90 minute battery life, waterproof technology and even an LED light, you never have to worry whether the lawnmower is up to the task. So all you have to do is focus on getting your junk exactly how you or your partner likes it. The folks at Manscaped recently sent me their Perfect Package 3.0 kit and I've been very impressed with the number of high quality products it provides. I've had this set for the last few weeks now, and I must say that I absolutely adore their ball deodorant. It has a gorgeous lavender smell to it, and if you use it after you shower, it leaves you feeling good and smelling great for the rest of the day. So if you want to get yourself some high quality male grooming products, help support the channel a little bit further, and shave 20% off your order plus free shipping, head on over to manscaped.com and use the promo code oddmanrush. That's manscaped.com and promo code oddmanrush for 20% off your order plus free shipping. Manscaped, your balls will thank you. But anyway, back to the video. In order to tell this expensive tale, allow me to take you back to June 26, 2009, when Vancouver Giants forward Evander Kane was taken fourth overall at the NHL entry draft by the Atlanta Thrashers. Less than a month after his selection on July 20th, the Thrashers signed Kane to a three-year entry-level contract, and though the deal would carry the usual rookie cap hit of just $900,000 a season, the various signing and performance bonuses attached meant that Kane was eligible to make up to $9.3 million from the deal. Not a bad payday for a teenager to receive, eh folks? Having just signed the first multi-million dollar deal of his career, Kane would quickly join the Thrashers for their preseason training camp several months later, earn a place on their opening night roster, and get ready to make his NHL debut as the 09-10 season commenced. Over the course of his entry-level contract, Kane would see himself transform from youngster learning the ropes to a key contributor on the scoreboard. With a modest 26 points in 66 games during his rookie year, Kane's sophomore season in the league would see his production vastly improve, as he finished the year with 19 goals and 43 points in 72 games. However, the final year of his entry-level deal would end up being one of his best seasons to date. As the Thrashers relocated to Winnipeg for the 11-12 NHL season and became the second iteration of the Jets, Kane would make quite the first impression for his new fan base. The former fourth overall pick would finish his debut year in Manitoba, having potted 30 goals and 57 points in 74 regular season games, both of which are still career highs for him almost a decade later. As his three-year deal came to an end, and having notched 49 goals and 100 points in 146 games over his last two seasons, it was clear that Kane had earned every penny of his entry-level deal, had emerged as one of the team's most productive forwards, and was due a pretty sizable raise over the coming years. Thankfully, the Jets were all too happy to oblige, as on September 15th, 2012, Winnipeg signed Kane to a six-year, $31.5 million contract worth an average annual value of $5.25 million a season. 
So thanks to his point production and his overall play, having seen continued improvement with each passing season, Kane had just ensured that he would earn over $40 million by his 27th birthday. Though he had secured his finances for the foreseeable future, the Canadian forward still had plenty of goals to score and a lot of money to make before he was done. The next three years of Kane's career would see him continue to produce strong numbers for the Jets, but he was unable to take his game to the next level and earn a reputation as a point-per-game star. With 33 points in 48 games during the lockout-shortened 12-13 season, 41 points in 63 games during the 13-14 season, and with 22 points in just 37 games midway through the 14-15 NHL season, Despite battling through a number of tough injuries during this span, the Canadian forward had managed to produce 46 goals and 96 points in his last 148 games. Having spent parts of six seasons in the Jets organization, and with injuries stopping him from taking the next step in his game, the Jets decided that it was time to part ways with their former fourth overall pick. On February 11th, 2015, it was announced that Winnipeg had traded Kane to the Buffalo Sabres as part of a seven-player deal. Though some of you may be confused as to why the Jets would trade away a former 30-goal scorer who could have easily returned to that number had he been healthy, Kane's tenure in Winnipeg had been anything but smooth sailing. For example, there were rumours that Kane wanted a trade out of Winnipeg the second the team got there back in 2011, and in January of 2012, he was asked to tone down his use of Twitter as his active posting on the platform had rubbed some members of the organisation the wrong way. Not only that, Kane had also come under fire when fans claimed he had walked out on several restaurant bills in the city, and he posted a now infamous image of him holding several large stacks of cash while the NHL was in the midst of a lockout and thousands of staff around the league were unemployed as a result. Maybe not the best timing on that one, bud. Oh, and he was also made a healthy scratch just a week before the trade took place due to an off-ice incident with his teammates. According to reports at the time, Kane had decided to violate team policy by arriving to a team meeting wearing a tracksuit, and after joining his teammates in some stretches and warm-ups, he found his clothes soaking wet in the shower. Though the culprit has never been confirmed, it was believed that Dustin Bufflin had been the one to commit the act, as he wanted to send a message to Kane about respecting the team's rules, something everybody else on the roster had no problem doing, so neither should he. These numerous off-ice incidents, coupled with his recent injury troubles and his hefty cap hit, prompted Winnipeg to pull the trigger on a trade as they felt it was in everyone's best interest if the two parties went their separate ways. When Kane was informed of this decision, however, the Canadian forward decided to air some of his frustrations about his now former organisation. When interviewed after the trade, Kane felt that the Jets didn't have his back when he was accused of assault and sued for financial damages back in April of 2014, claiming that the team preferred to trade away their problems rather than to help resolve them. It's probably worth mentioning that Kane was neither arrested nor charged by law enforcement as a result of these claims, as police found there was insufficient evidence to charge him and the case was considered closed to them. Maybe Winnipeg should have had his back after all. But regardless, having left the only NHL team he had ever known under less than ideal circumstances, Kane would spend the rest of the 14-15 NHL season on the Sabres injured reserve list, having undergone surgery on his shoulder soon after the trade, an injury he had supposedly been playing through for most of the year while in Winnipeg. Once he eventually returned to full health though, Kane would finally join the Sabres lineup take to the ice for the first time in eight months, and look forward to earning another $15 million during the latter half of his six-year contract. Though he would continue to struggle with the injury bug during his debut year with the Sabres, the former fourth overall pick would post a 20-goal year for the first time since the 11-12 season, en route to scoring 35 points in 65 games that year. In fact, Kane would notch 20 goals in each of his next three seasons and once again become one of his team's most productive scorers, as he potted 16 goals and 118 points in 196 games midway through his third year on the team. As the 17-18 NHL season entered its latter stages, and with the Sabres once again sitting at the bottom of the league standings, Buffalo were keen to offload many of their expiring contracts and acquire some prospects and or draft picks in return. 
With his six-year deal coming to an end at the conclusion of the season, and with 40 points in his first 61 games of the year, the Canadian forward would soon find himself on the move once again. Just before the trade deadline on February 26th, 2018, it was announced that Buffalo had traded Kane to the San Jose Sharks in exchange for Danny O'Regan, a 2019 conditional first round pick and a 2020 conditional fourth round pick. Having joined the third NHL team of his career and with him needing a new contract for the upcoming season, Kane was looking to make a strong first impression with the Sharks and earn himself another huge payday. Luckily for both the player and the organisation, he wouldn't disappoint, as the Canadian forward potted 9 goals and 14 points in the final 17 games of the year, bringing his full season totals to 29 goals and 54 points in 78 games. Not only that, Kane would also get to suit up in the Stanley Cup playoffs for the first time in his 9 year NHL career, where he potted 5 points in 9 games for his efforts, so he wasted little time making an impact during his first trip to the postseason too. Once the season had come to an end and his 6 year contract had expired, both Kane and San Jose were keen to keep this partnership going for the foreseeable future. This mutual understanding culminated with pen hitting paper on May 24th, 2018, as the Sharks signed Kane to a 7 year, $49 million contract worth an average annual value of $7 million a season. So thanks to a strong debut with his new team, Evander Kane had just ensured that he would earn close to $90 million by his 34th birthday. Though he had just signed the biggest and most expensive contract of his NHL career, the forward would soon find himself in quite the money trouble. Over the next two seasons, Kane would suit up exclusively for the Sharks and would waste little time returning to his career-high play of years past. With a 30-goal, 56-point year during the 18-19 season, and with 47 points in just 64 games during the most recent 2019-20 season, the Canadian forward had gotten his prime years off to a great start by registering the most productive back-to-back -back seasons of his entire NHL career. He even led the league in penalty minutes in both of those years too. So just two seasons into his shiny new contract, Kane was playing some of the best hockey of his career, had earned another $14 million, and was looking forward to bolstering his bank account with a further $35 million over the next half a decade. Unfortunately though, Kane's finances were about to come crashing down around him. Less than a week before the Sharks were set to begin their virus-shortened 2021 NHL season, on January 9th, 2021, reports began to surface claiming that Evander Kane was being sued by Centennial Bank for a total of $8.3 million. According to the suit, the bank had initially given Kane a $3.9 million loan for business and investment opportunities back in September of 2018, before providing him with several additional loans at a number of later dates, all of which were secured by Kane's contract with the Sharks. The complaint argued that the Sharks were contractually obliged to pay off the loans directly out of Kane's wages, but the bank stopped receiving payments in October of 2019. It is then claimed that Kane defaulted on the loan just two months later, in December of 2019, as he missed a payment and the bank has received no more payments from him since. As of December 11th, 2020, Centennial Bank claims that the $8.3 million that Kane owes to them is made up of $7.8 million in outstanding loan repayments, approximately $503,000 of interest, and roughly $90,000 of bank fees. Though he had clearly gotten himself into a pretty sticky situation, the Canadian forward was about to drop one hell of a bombshell. Just two days after the lawsuit was made public on January 11th, it was revealed that Evander Kane had filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. According to documents filed as part of the proceedings, Kane listed more than $26.8 million in total liabilities, including $16 million in unpaid loans, $1.5 million in gambling losses, and more than $10.2 million in assets, mostly comprised of real estate, including a $3 million home in San Jose and a pair of homes in Vancouver valued at $5.26 million between them. Not only that, 
Kane also owed over $250,000 in unpaid taxes, over half a million dollars in agents fees, and nearly $80,000 in credit card debt. While court documents stated that Kane had been losing over $90,000 a month, despite his $7 million yearly salary. So not only was he being sued by Centennial Bank for $8.3 million, Evander Kane had somehow managed to rack up almost $27 million in debt. So that's why he wanted to fight one of the Paul brothers so badly. Oh, but we're not done there, folks. According to recent reports, Kane is currently facing six pending lawsuits against him, he's already concluded three additional suits over the last few months, and there are 47 different creditors that Kane has yet to pay in full. So by the time everything has been figured out, Kane will have been sued nine different times, and will have had to have paid off nearly 50 different creditors before he's finally in the clear. The guy's made over $50 million during his NHL career. What on earth has happened here? Interestingly though, this isn't the first time that Kane has found himself in some money trouble during his NHL career. On November 4th, 2019, it was revealed that Kane was being sued by the Cosmopolitan Casino in Vegas after he allegedly walked out on half a million dollars worth of gambling debt. The suit alleged that Kane received $500,000 in gambling markers in eight different installments, ranging in value from $20,000 to $100,000, but he left the casino without making arrangements to settle the debt. In order to recover what was owed to them, the casino filed a lawsuit against Kane soon after, where they sought full restitution plus the repayment of legal fees. However, the case was later dropped by the casino several months later, so it's unsure whether Kane had repaid them in full, or the two parties had come to an arrangement outside of court. That said, Kane didn't seem to learn his lesson from the whole ordeal, as the $1.5 million of gambling debt that he filed during his bankruptcy was supposedly all owed to the Cosmopolitan Casino. It's even alleged that Kane racked up this sizable debt in the month before he filed for bankruptcy alone. So not only was he sued for half a million dollars in gambling debts over a year ago, Kane had somehow racked up three times his previous debt, supposedly in a single month. Looks like somebody needs to learn when to call it quits, eh folks? Now some of you may be wondering how this situation compares to Jack Johnson's bankruptcy back in 2014. And well, the truth is, it really doesn't. Johnson's bankruptcy was brought about by his parents abusing their power of attorney over him in order to take out multiple high interest loans and rack up millions of dollars of debt in his name. And though Kane's bankruptcy seems just as reckless, it appears to be completely self-inflicted. Obviously, Kane's situation is still very recent, and details regarding his debts are still coming to light, so there is the possibility that new information may suggest otherwise in due time. That said, as things stand right now, Kane seems to have brought about this tough financial situation all by himself. If you want my opinion on all this, I think it's pretty fair to suggest that Kane's circumstances are a lot less sympathetic than Johnson's were and the fact that Kane has been able to rack up such a sizable amount of debt despite the large amount of money he's earned during his career is absolutely baffling to me. I mean, the guy's made over $50 million while playing in the NHL, so for him to have accumulated nearly $27 million of debt on top of the money he's earned means one of three things to me. Either he is trying to live a lifestyle that he simply cannot afford, he has made some terrible business decisions over the years, or he desperately needs to hire a competent financial advisor. If the reports are true, and Kane has racked up all of this debt by himself, then I personally find it very difficult to feel all that sorry for him, especially since he has earned more than enough in his career to pay off his debts had he taken better care of his finances, and a sizable amount of his debt has come from gambling or buying one of his many extravagant houses. Given that he has been more than willing to flash his cash and go all in at the casino at several points during his career, it's possible that behind the wealthy, successful image he has created for himself in the public eye, Evander Kane has been digging this financial hole for longer than anyone can think. So where does he go from here? Well, having filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy, Kane will likely have to forfeit most, if not all, of his valuable assets, apart from those considered necessary for both him and his seven other dependents that are also living with him. 
Alongside his bankruptcy announcement, reports also began to emerge suggesting that Kane may opt out of the 2021 NHL season due to concerns over the virus for his six-month-old child. It was even suggested that he might go as far as to terminate his contract with San Jose. Though this might sound like a ridiculous idea given the financial hellhole that he's currently in, many of Kane's debts were directly tied to his contract with the Sharks, so by terminating his deal with the team, a number of Kane's debtors would no longer be entitled to his salary that year. If he instead decided to opt out of the season though, Kane might have had the possibility to defer the third year of his deal despite missing the December 24th deadline, pick his contract back up during the following season, and continue to pay off his debts with his usual yearly salary. However, all of these rumours were proven to be untrue, as Kane joined the Sharks for their pre-season training camp and opted in to playing the season. With four points in his first three games of the year at the time of this recording, Kane seems to be doing a great job at blocking out his off-ice worries as he takes to the ice in his third full season with the Sharks. Given the severity of those troubles though, Kane's gonna need to keep it up for quite some time if he wants to finish his career strong and earn another decent payday or two before he hangs up his skates for good. For context, if every single penny that Kane makes on his current contract went to paying off his debts from now until it's all cleared, he would finally be debt free once his 7 year deal had concluded in 2025. So after making nearly $90 million by the time he enters his 16th year in the NHL, provided there aren't any other speed bumps along the way, Kane will have almost nothing left of his fortune once his debts are all cleared. Add to that the fact that he'll be 34 years old once his contract is up, and it's highly unlikely that Kane will be able to earn back even a fraction of what he's already made and subsequently lost so far in his career, let alone get anywhere close to $90 million. It just goes to show you folks that you can be a successful athlete and have all the money in the world, but all it takes is several wrong decisions, and everything you have worked so hard for is gone in an instant. The way in which he has got to this point isn't exactly the most sympathetic, but here's hoping that Evander Kane can get everything figured out over the next few years, pay off his debts so he's finally in the clear, and move past this whole situation sooner rather than later. If not for him, for his family's sake. And that's the story of Evander Kane's journey from millionaire to bankruptcy. What do you guys think about Kane's situation? How do you compare it to your thoughts on what Jack Johnson had to go through in 2014? Has it changed your opinion on Johnson's struggles perhaps? Let me know in the comments below, I'd love to hear what you guys think. But thank you very much for watching guys, I hope you have enjoyed. Please feel free to like, subscribe, share, or watch some of my other videos. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye! A big thank you to Carl Fairbank, Chris Gadsby, Connor B, Drew Fawcett, Jordan Whitehead, Martin Tolness, Roman from London, Tom from Finland, and Worthless Pieces for helping support this video via Patreon. If you too want to help support the channel a little bit further, and get a shout out at the end of every future video, make sure you head over to patreon.com slash oddmanrush and become a patron today.